Welcome, everyone, and thank you to the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center webinar on Keys to a Successful Volunteer Transportation Program, Risk, Liability, and Insurance webinar. Um, we are pleased to have you with us today. Um, I apologize for starting a couple minutes late. We had a little uh, trouble getting everybody on the phone, but we are all ready to go. Uh, and I am quite sure it will be worth uh, the wait. Uh, and so we have lots of questions that were received from all of you, um, and uh, the presenters have a lot of information to share as well. Uh, before we get started, though, before I turn the session over, I do want to go through a couple of housekeeping items to make sure that you guys um, know what to expect over the next uh, hour and a half. Um, we are recording the webinar today. Um, it's uh, important to note that the chat section is a public um, uh, portion of the webinar room, and so anything that you post there can be viewed by other people participating, and it will also be available um, for viewing on the archive as well. Um, we also ask that if you are connected both by the phone and by the Internet that you mute your computer speakers. Um, if it hasn't already, you will experience some feedback uh, by having the volume uh, or the audio come through both ways. And so you can go ahead and mute those computer speakers at this time. Uh, and then if you're having any trouble, if you're on the phone and you're trying to get into the black bar, uh, Blackboard webinar room, um, you have a few options. Um, you can participate just by the phone. There's no problem with that. We did email the presentation, so you can uh, open that up or print it out and follow along that way. Um, or uh, if you want, you can contact Blackboard Technical Assistance, which is at 877-382-2293. Um, or you can email me. Um, I did email the connection information out, so you should have that email handy. Um, if not, it's uh, McLaughlin and McLaughlin at gmail.com, and that's M-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. So McLaughlin and McLaughlin at gmail.com. Um, we have two ways in which you can uh, ask a question uh, today or make a comment. Uh, in addition to the questions that we've already received, if you wanted to do that, um, you can either type your question into the chat box, which is to the left uh, bottom of your screen, um, or if you're not on the webinar room um, and you would prefer to send an email, um, you can send an email to Heather at hedmonds at n4a.org. And that's H-E-D-M-O-N-D-S at n4a.org. Um, we'll give that again at the end, um, so don't feel like you have to remember. And then finally, um, we are providing captioning for the session today. Um, you can access that in one of two ways. You can either press the CC icon, which is at the top uh, left of your screen, or um, you can press the Control and F8 button. Um, and by doing those at the same time, you'll get a, um, a separate box that pops up that you can customize to the size that would uh, most benefit you. Uh, if you choose to do that. Um, so with that, I'm happy to turn the session over to Virginia Dyes, the co-director of the NADTC, um, to get us started. Thank you very much, Christy. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I want to begin by talking a little bit about the NADTC. I feel pretty certain uh, that most of you all on the phone um, have at least heard of us. Um, but just to remind you that the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center is a national technical assistance center that is funded by the Federal Transit Administration. We are a partnership between Easter Seals and the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, um, or N4A. Um, and I work at N4A. Um, I also want to uh, say that um, this webinar um, was mostly organized by uh, one of my colleagues, Melissa Gray, um, who is away from the office today. But uh, she has been the person who's been in contact with speakers and selected speakers. And this particular webinar on volunteer transportation and risk, liability, and insurance um, is an outgrowth of an online course that uh, we are just completing um, through the NADTC uh, that was on volunteer transportation. We had about um, over 90 people who registered for that um, 
course, and very pleased to include this live webinar and include a broader audience uh, to participate in it uh, beyond those who um, registered for the course. Um, we will be producing um, a, a, some materials from the course, which will include uh, all the presentations, all the PowerPoint presentations, um, and an extensive list of resources um, that were developed uh, to provide assistance to those who were taking the course. Um, and that will be available probably in December. Um, and it will be available on the NADTC website. And we will notify those who receive our e-news um, of its availability. If you don't get e our e-news, you can sign up for it at our website, which is www.nadtc.org. Um, one final note about the NADTC and our reason for doing this session. Um, our mission at the NADTC is very broad and big, and it is meant to focus our efforts on working with communities and helping them increase transportation options that are accessible and usable by older adults and people with disabilities. And based on the calls and emails that we get at the center uh, and the work that we've done over the last three years, um, we know that volunteer transportation is an issue that many communities are grappling with, many communities offer and are looking for ways to do it better. Um, it's, it's a common question for us. Um, and there are so many complicated issues that are about, the, that are surrounding uh, this topic. Um, but risk and liability seems to, uh, and insurance seem to be um, at the top of folks' um, questions and issues. Um, so today we have, uh, we're very privileged, I would say, to have a, a really fantastic panel of folks who are doing this work um, in their communities. Um, and I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they're going to speak. First, there's T.J. Burr. With, he's a mobility manager with All Points Transit um, in Montrose, Colorado. Uh, followed by Doreen Doherty, and I hope I said your name right, Doreen. Uh, she is a program planning and evaluation analyst with the Sonoma County, California Area Agency on Aging in Santa Rosa. The third speaker is Jennifer Conorak, who is a manager with NV Rides in Fairfax, Virginia. And our final speaker is Joni Shaver, who directs the Blunt County Office on Aging Senior Miles or SMILES program in Maryville, Tennessee. Um, so together, our speakers represent some different geographies, some different um, organizations, um, and some different perspectives that we think um, will help you uh, uh, have a better understanding of these critical issues. After the formal presentations, we will have some facilitated discussion. And I want to thank everyone who sent in questions earlier. Um, we've got some really good questions. And our practice uh, with the NADTC webinars is that questions that we don't get to, we will provide answers to. It may take us a little while, but eventually those will be um, posted on our website um, so that those who are participating in the webinar will get answers to their questions and also will be able to expose a broader audience to those issues. Um, I've talked already about the NADTC uh, uh, mission and our partnership and funding source. Um, we also, in addition to receiving funding from the Federal Transit Administration, we also get advice and guidance from the Administration for Community Living. And I can't emphasize that enough because it allows us to ensure that we're really on target with those critical populations that we serve, older adults, people with disabilities, and family caregivers especially. Um, 
I've already mentioned our mission, which is very broad. We do a lot of technical assistance, training, communication, outreach, and we do primarily offer support for communities. Um, we used a uh, blog that was done uh, and posted on our website uh, called The Keys to a Successful Volunteer Program to organize the overall course that we offered. Um, and I think these are critical and important issues for any community that is thinking about volunteer transportation, and these are the issues that those who are already offering that type of program continue to grapple with and improve and expand as time goes on. Uh, funding, of course, is always at the top of our list. Um, community context and collaboration, and by that we mean it's really important to fit whatever you develop in terms of a, of a volunteer program into your specific community. Where are the gaps? What need is the program designed to meet? Because it's very important, especially in the creation stages of these programs, not to raise expectations that you can't meet um, and to ensure that you're using the resources that you have um, in the most um, cost effective and most appropriate way that is going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, driver recruitment and retention are always issues. Data collection and knowing what you're doing uh, are really critical for ensuring that, one, you can share that information with your funders and also use it to promote the need for greater funding, um, especially uh, collecting information not just about your successes but about needs that you're unable to meet because of resources. Um, and it's very important to measure and share that impact with a very broad audience. Risk, liability, and insurance are, of course, critical issues. And I've talked with folks around the country who tell me that the reason that they don't have a volunteer program in place is because of concerns that have been raised about risk, liability, and insurance. So we hope that today we're going to answer some of those very important questions. Um, and we're going to uh, also probably um, identify aspects and issues that maybe you haven't thought about. Um, we hope you find this uh, webinar to be valuable. We look forward to the discussion at the end. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, TJ Burr, Mobility Manager with All Points Transit in Montrose, California, uh, Colorado. Excuse me. Uh, TJ, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Yes, uh, my name is TJ Burr. I'm the Mobility Manager with All Points Transit in Montrose, Colorado. Let's make this work here. Um, so to start with, here's a brief overview of our volunteer driver program. Here at All Points Transit, we cover four counties in rural southwestern Colorado. Our coverage area actually includes about 4,500 square miles, very rural, uh, very small towns, the biggest of which is kind of our hub here, Montrose, a, a town of about 20,000. We deliver seniors, persons with disabilities, and the general public to clinics, senior centers, and personal appointments in their individual towns, those rural outposts, on our door-to-door -door driver assisted dial-a-ride program. And we also find a lot of those folks into or around the regional hub, Montrose, which, as I said, is a town of about 20,000 here, the houses of the regional hospital, as well as uh, some more specialists and services. Most of our routes are actually designed to come into Montrose, as it is that hub, and get people from those uh, rural outposts to Montrose or get folks around Montrose. Uh, what we found, however, is the trend with medical requests is becoming much more regional. So we're seeing more folks who need to get to Grand Junction, which is about 60 miles away, or to smaller towns even to keep specialists that they may have once had when they lived there, such as Delta or Ridgeway. And these are difficult for us to fulfill as they are they're essentially going backwards from the way we standardly operate, backwards flow. Um, so the volunteer program has really evolved uh, over the last couple of years to help us fulfill many of those backwards requests. And it helps us to get folks to uh, where they need to go and we get to say no a lot less often. So I know for today's webinar, we're focused mostly on 
risk, liability, and insurance and those aspects of our, our volunteer driver program. So as you'll see there on the first slide, um, we talk a little bit about uh, what we do with our volunteers in terms of our three-day training program. And that involves an orientation, kind of a review of some policies and procedures, vehicle overview and safety, a drive test, and drug testing uh, per FTA requirements. We are a regional nonprofit, but we do receive some FTA funding, so we're subject to their standards and guidelines. Um, really, this training program is a, a miniature version of our paid driver training. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward here. So initially, we do a, a some initial setup and screening. Uh, when we're seeking to get a new volunteer started, this is really our process. We start with a, a specific volunteer driver application. So from this application, we, we perform a background check, similar to what we would do with a, a paid employee. Um, we also require the volunteer to supply a copy of their motor vehicle record, which in Colorado at least, these are available at the, at the DMV for $9. Um, and like I spoke to, as we are a nonprofit who does receive some FTA funding, the volunteer is really uh, subjected to the same. It's a different drug pool, but they, they are subjected to a, their own drug pool with an initial test and then some ongoing testing at random as well. So part of that three-day training, you can see day one there is actually with me. I'm the mobility manager, also the volunteer driver program coordinator. Um, once, assuming they made it through that initial screening process, we then move on to this day one. And I go through a pretty thorough All Points Transit program overview. We really want our volunteers to be a true extension of our organization. In our minds, the better educated and informed they are as to who we are and what we do, the better they can represent us when act interacting with our passengers. And as importantly, they can be advocates for us in their personal and professional circles. We have found that most everyone knows that we exist and they see the buses out there, but far fewer actually understand how we operate and exactly what we can do. So it's great to get these folks that information. Um, on this first day, we also go through our company policies and procedures, so those expectations are clearly set. The duties of the volunteer are clearly outlined, they're defined, and they're agreed upon. We actually give them a volunteer driver handbook, and that book contains all, all the program overview I spoke about, also those policies and procedures. And each of those policies and procedures is actually signed off on by the volunteer, and we keep a separate file uh, for each volunteer that includes uh, those signed off on policies and procedures in addition to their other pertinent and important information. Day two of the training is actually with our operations manager, and this uh, shifts much more from the overview, uh, more to the you know the passenger experience and in the vehicle best practices. Uh, the, the operations manager discusses the passenger pickup procedures, how we assist our passengers, things like that. The expectations of our door-to-door -door service, our ready window in terms of when somebody needs to be ready for their trip how we secure our passengers and any mobility devices they may have, so be that a, a small walker or uh, oxygen tanks, things like that. She also discusses our manifest, which is really our trip, over, our trip schedules, our trip overviews, and how to read them and all the information that's contained within them. She speaks to our, uh, trains our volunteers extensively on um, how to use our dispatchers, basically for anything and everything, and, and when to utilize them, and uh, speaks to the tremendous resource that they are. She also covers our radio, which I'll speak a little bit more about later, but uh, two-way radio, how it works, when to use it, what we can say over the airwaves, things like that. And lastly, she begins an introduction to the volunteer driver vehicle, which in our case is a 2013 Toyota Prius. So we have one vehicle that our volunteer pool uses and it is that Prius, which does allow us, of course, to be very efficient with those uh, with those rural backwards trips I talked about earlier. Um, in a Prius with a volunteer, it's, it's about as good as it gets in terms of efficiency for us. The challenge, of course, becomes that it's somewhat limited in folks that can get into that vehicle, uh, limited to ambulatory individuals. And then in the last part of the day, too, there, she also works with the folks on inter introduction to our pre- and post-trip reports as completing those reports thoroughly and accurately is a, a manda mandatory requirement of all of our drivers, our volunteer drivers, as well as our paid drivers. 
And finally here we get to day three of our training, which is an actual drive test with that, that same operations manager. She rides along with the volunteer and, and runs them through a pretty standard checklist and that ensures that they can safely and efficiently operate that vehicle on the road. And of course, assuming they pass that uh, checklist, uh, she has her notes and, and that goes in their file as well. Uh, an interesting result of this three-day training process that we discovered is that many potential volunteers realize this isn't exactly what they're seeking for a volunteer opportunity. The drug testing, the somewhat extensive training, that three-day commitment to get certified, we find a lot of people who just want to show up and drive. So we end up losing a, a decent amount of folks through this process. You can look at that one of two ways. Uh, one, that that's a bummer, but we, we are okay with it because the process is really in, in place for a reason, helping us to mitigate our risk and liability. Um, and those that do make it through or, or stick with it, they become very steady, reliable volunteers and really true extensions of All Points Transit, which is, like I spoke to earlier, really our goal. You can see some other general information down there on the bottom. Uh, I spoke a little bit about the radio already. The vehicle and the driver, given that we have that uh, 2013 Prius, they're insured under our general company policy. Uh, just some more notes there. If a volunteer is absent for three or more months, and we have a lot of their volunteers by nature to go on vacations and things like that. But if they don't take a trip within that three-month period, we'll, we'll basically recertify them, we complete their training. And I spoke to us earlier too, but after that initial drug test uh, per our funding, the volunteers, just like our, our paid drivers, are subject to, to random testing. So much more on our program. I know we were focused today mostly on risk, liability, and insurance. Hopefully that gives you a better picture of how we handle those things here at All Points Transit. Thank you. Thank you so much, TJ. I appreciate all of that great information. Um, we are going to go on to our next presenter, who is Noreen Doherty um, with the Sonoma County Area Agency on Aging in Santa Rosa, California. Noreen? Yes, hi. Thank you very much. And I am one of the speakers who um, is having challenges with my slides. So if you don't mind advancing for me, that would be great. Um, Thank you. So yes, my name is Noreen Doherty. I'm an evaluation and program planning about, uh, analyst with Sonoma County Human Services Department with the Area Agency on Aging. Um, so Sonoma County is actually one of the nine counties that make up the San Francisco Bay Area, and we're located about 50 miles north of San Francisco. Um, Sonoma County is home to a very large older adult population with um, a little over 25% of our population aged 60 and older. And um, as I mentioned, we are within the Adult and Aging Services um, Division, so we do offer a lot of uh, varying services, but of course we're focusing on transportation for today. Um, Sonoma County is quite large compared to our neighboring counties. It's also very geographically di diverse with a mix of rural and suburban areas. Um, so we do face challenges in serving homebound and geographically isolated community members because of our geographic makeup. Next slide, please. So um, to address our transportation barriers and challenges of our county and the growing needs of our growing older adult population, the Sonoma County AAA does have a vision of coordinated transportation services. Our vision is to have volunteer driver programs throughout the whole county, and currently our volunteer driver program consists of no, uh, four nonprofit agencies with two new agencies coming on board as soon as we um, are able to solidify our contracts. And I apologize, I think something, um, my slides got a little wonky in the transfer, so, but hopefully they still make sense. Um, so we, let's see, we do bring together advocates, community partners, and service providers to advocate, engage, and coordinate um, the community and partners to increase transportation access services. We actually have um, created our AAA Advisory Council Transportation and Mobility Committee, in, uh, which started in 2006. And that brings together service providers and um, AAA Transportation Mobility Committee members on a monthly basis. Um, the role of the Transportation Mobility Committee is to coordinate services among service providers, share best practices, discuss challenges, and identify areas to focus as, as well as we expand, um, including risk and liability. 
Um, we also have what's called the Sonoma Access Coordinated Transportation Services, the SACS Consortium, which began in 2011 and actually casts a wider net to bring together a larger group of partners on a quarterly basis. Um, the role of the SACS Consortium is similar to the Transportation Mobility Committee. However, the group tends to focus on larger regional challenges and efforts. Um, so our volunteer driver program fits into our broader community transportation efforts by prioritizing coordination and collaboration with other agencies. Um, the SACS Consortium, it's not only just a consortium, but it is an actual comprehensive planning initiative to create collaborative strategies for public and private transportation service delivery that serves the needs of older adults and people with disabilities. And the SACS vision is that by 2020, the work of SACS will result in the improved availability and awareness of socially equitable, easily accessible systems that are sustainable. Um, so through the creation of the SACS consortium, we have successfully brought together over 80 individuals, including county organizations, concerned members of the public, our three fixed transit agencies, um, local health, disabled, and senior service providers. And our consortium works together to identify ways to coordinate transportation options, create an inventory of services, identify gaps and barriers in services, and how to strengthen to overcome the barriers. Next slide, please. So um, our volunteer driver services are curb to curb. Um, however, volunteers do use their discretion for providing a door-to-door -door service. Um, our program is unique in that the drivers use their own vehicles and gas. However, they are reimbursed for mileage. Um, the program did begin in 2008, and we're actually gearing up for our 10-year anniversary, which is really exciting. Um, in the last fiscal year, we produced close to um, 20,000 uh, trips. And drivers um, do use their own, own vehicles, as I mentioned, so that really um, brings in a whole different layer of liability. Um, for the next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, all of our contracted nonprofit agencies provide their own liability insurance. So that covers their drivers. Um, all of our agencies hold a, a $2 million liability insurance coverage, and that is part of their requirement to contract with us. So when we um, enter into an agreement with an agency, um, that's part of what our, our contracts unit helps um, us process with them is making sure they have those insurance and liability components on their end in place. Um, and in general, the policies that govern our programs from there are taken from regulations from our funders, such as the California Department of Aging with our Older Americans Act funding, as well as um, the Federal Transit Administration with our Caltrans 5310 funding. Um, however, as a consortium of providers that I talked about, we have had to develop our own uh, agreed upon policies. So basically when an issue arises, we expect our partner agencies to bring them into one of our transportation and mobility committees or the SACS committee to discuss with the group. And next slide, please. Uh, so from there, the group seeks to develop unified messaging and talking points that each provider can refer to. So for example, all agencies have a five-day advance notice for a ride request. Um, all agencies provide no more than two rides a week to the same person. Um, another important way that we've learned to mitigate risk is by doing really thorough trainings with the volunteer drivers. Um, all of our partner agencies are required to deliver a minimum four-hour training to new volunteers um, with booster trainings as needed. But we do require um, these trainings to be annual, and they are put on by each of our nonprofit agencies. Um, the requirement on our end is that it has to be a minimum of four hours and, and reach specific points of education. But from there, we really do let our agencies develop their training um, based on you know, some of their organizational priorities. So we really have, a, again, our unique structure in that we do leave autonomy um, within parameters for the partner agencies that we work with. Um, and we also do incorporate, um, we do a, a driver and rider evaluation um, survey. So we do incorporate data collection in, into how we continuously improve our, our services. And so that can uh, frequently cover issues around risk and liability. Um, and we hope that by taking uh, the feedback of riders and drivers into account that um, that these will be opportunities for program strengthening and growth. 
Um, so yeah, our partner agencies do train folks on things like helping people in and out of the car, dealing with medical emergencies, working with mobility aids, etc. But um, again, we do leave a, a decent amount of leeway for partner agencies to incorporate their own structure as well. So I'm sure folks will have lots of uh, questions, but that concludes my portion of the presentation. And I'll turn it back to our moderator. All right, thank you so much. Yes, very, very good information. And uh, we're already getting uh, tons of questions in, which is really um, a positive thing. So thank you so much. And we are going to move on to our next presenter, uh, Jennifer Kanarek, uh, who is the manager of Envy Rides in Fairfax, Virginia. Jennifer? Thank you. Um, again, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Jennifer Kinnerick. I'm the manager of NB Rides in Fairfax, Virginia. Fairfax is located just um, 30 minutes west of Washington, D.C. Um, so we are sort of um, the central part of Northern Virginia and the D.C. suburbs. Um, we have a very large um, and growing population of folks wanting to age in place, stay in their homes as they age. And um, NB Rides was actually started um, in 2014 as a response to this growing um, need for uh, folks um, you know, wanting to access transportation but might not be able to um, easily access public transportation in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Um, we are a program that is a collaboration between a number of uh, nonprofits and local government. Um, we were started um, actually at the bequest of Fairfax County government um, as a response to a study that the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors um, started in 2012, um, which resulted in the which resulted in the 50 plus community action plan, which is about 31 initiatives. Um, that the Board of Supervisors here in Fairfax County were initiating to help folks who wish to age in place um, do so easily. And Envy Rise was an, an idea that was brought to the Jewish Community Center of Northern Virginia where the program is housed. Um, we then partnered with um, Jewish Council for the Aging, which is located in Montgomery County, uh, who had a lot of expertise in senior transportation. And um, we started the program in 2014 with four partner organizations. Um, and in four years, we've grown that to about 12 partner organizations, which with about two more, two to three more that are slated to join this year. Um, so a little bit about the objectives um, is to increase the capacity of volunteer driver programs um, by offering free or low-cost rides to non-driving seniors. Um, and also with the goal to streamline the already existing volunteer driver programs that were in existence in Northern Virginia, um, and also to increase awareness for volunteer driver programs as an option for um, senior transportation in the community. Um, so a little bit about how we work. So we are a coordinated hub of volunteer driver programs. And what NV Rides does is we provide support to the local um, community-based organizations that either have an inter that either have a volunteer driver program or for those who are looking to start a volunteer driver program. And so the components are about five things. The backbone, really, of the NV Rides program is an internet-based ride scheduling software that NV Rides has a licensing agreement um, with its vendor to bundle um, as many volunteer driver programs that would like to access the software um, onto um, into one central sort of cloud-based software for scheduling. Um, we pay for all the volunteer driver background checks. So the organization that um, is administering the volunteer driver program conducts those background checks, but NV Rides funds them. Um, we help our partners create um, marketing 
and volunteer recruitment um, plans and strategic plans of how to increase volunteer capacity. Um, and like I said earlier, with those who are looking to start a volunteer driver program, we will help them with program development support. Um, and we also function as a referral service. Um, when calls come through to NV Rides, we refer um, those who are in who are in need of transportation to partners if there is one uh, if there is a volunteer driver program operating in the um, the potential riders uh, neighborhood. If there is not one, we do function as a referral service and we refer them to other modes of transportation, either through local government um, or private companies. And these services that we provide to the nonprofits and community-based organizations that are part of our network are offered at no cost to the participating organization. So a little bit about the volunteers. Um, the volunteers who um, who our, community, who our partners recruit, they sign up to drive for the program in their own neighborhood. NV Rides does not do any of the intake for the volunteer drivers. Um, that is done by the partner programs. Um, the drivers are then, uh, so, so NV Rides interaction with the um, drivers is that we set the volunteer drivers up um, to be users on the ride scheduling software. Again, it's cloud-based. It can be accessed from home computers or tablets. Um, and the drivers are able to accept rides based on their location and their availability. We find, um, or we see the ride scheduling software as really quite key to the program because it really puts the onus on the volunteer to schedule the rides that they take based on their, their, their availability and their geography. Um, so we see it as a really great volunteer engagement tool. Um, volunteers use their own gas and vehicles. There is no reimbursement for, for gas. Um, however, the ride scheduling system will allow volunteers to track their mileage um, and their volunteer hours as well. Um, and so in order to be part of the NV Rides program for the community-based organization, the only thing that we require is a signed program MOU, um, which basically details what NV Rides provides for the organization and what we expect from the volunteer um, driver program. Um, and that is that they must have a supplemental umbrella insurance policy. We do not dictate how much um, the organization should carry, but the suggested is $1 million. Um, the providers, the, the service providers or program partners do need to attend three to four meetings a year um, hosted by NV Rides. These meetings are informational. They enable vol the, the leaders of volunteer driver programs to network with one another and share best practices on how to administer a volunteer driver program. And we always provide a um, some sort of workshop to provide uh, you know, continuing education to volunteer um, driver program leaders on how to best run their volunteer driver program. Um, it also gives a really good opportunity for, um, for more established driver programs to mentor some of the younger driver programs. Um, and we also require our program partners to participate in various NV Rides outreach events that we do on a regular basis to recruit volunteer drivers. And um, you know, program partners basically are their own uh, autonomous organization. They set their own policy procedures and guidelines around volunteer drivers and clients. NV Rides um, just supports their, their program with the um, elements that I spoke about earlier. So the risk liability and insurance, um, again, uh, the drivers drive for the organization that is uh, convenient to them in their in their neighborhood. Um, they use their own auto insurance. Again, they're backed by the organization that they drive for with their supplemental umbrella insurance. Um, they must have a valid driver's license and proof of insurance. Um, they should be at least 21 years of age, but again, it varies across programs. Some of our 
Driver programs that are partnered with NV Rides require 25 as the threshold uh, minimum age to drive, um, but we do have some providers that um, that have 18 as the as the threshold for driving. Um, the drivers must agree to have a criminal and um, MVR background check, which again is paid for by NV Rides, um, and we defer to the Fairfax County volunteer policy. Um, which is that more than six points in the driving record um, will disqualify one from volunteering. And uh, oh, Joni, and um, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Um, I, again, another set of a, a great uh, information provided. So thank you, um, and we are continuing to get questions. So just a reminder, if you do want to post your questions in the chat section, you can go ahead and do that, um, or you can email them in, um, and we'll be uh, giving the instructions on questions again here in just a second. So um, with that, we're going to go on to our next speaker, uh, Joni Shaver, who is the director from the Blount County Office on Aging in Maryville, Tennessee. And Joni, I will advance your slides, so just give me a quick note when I need to do that. All right, thank you. Our program is a membership program. It serves our county only, which is Blount County, which is eastern Tennessee, backed up to the foothills of the Smoky Mountains. And it's quite rural. We have about 125,000 people in our county. Um, and to start with screening, the screening starts when, with the first phone call to our office for a volunteer. Um, once they're given the information that about the program and the requirements, what we're asking our volunteers to do, um, which is included in the job description that we've created, um, they are scheduled to come in for a training. At the training, if they have not completed an application, they do it then. They provide us with two reference checks, um, and we check both of them. And we do a 50-state background check using verified volunteers, um, which we've had very great success with. We get uh, background checks back usually within 24 hours, which is incredibly fast from my experience. We have uh, copies of their driver's license and insurance that we receive when they attend the training. We don't do the background check until after they've successfully completed the four-hour training that we provide. And we do that because we pay for that background check, so we want to be sure that they're committed and they want to move forward. We also keep their driver's license and insurance information updated. So our software tracks when those expiration dates are, and then that gives us an opportunity to remain in contact with our volunteers. And um, by talking with them and requesting that information, we maintain their interest, encourage them, thank them, and keep them engaged in the process. The next screen on training, um, at the training, which is uh, pretty much we, hit, we schedule trainings as needed. Uh, we don't do them on a set day and time. We usually do them in the afternoon. It's four hours. And at the training, we go over the mission of the program, what it, what, why it started, why it's valuable, what the need is. We go over very basic, we have very basic policies and procedures. We have them sign a confidentiality uh, statement and impress on them the importance of remaining, having the personal information they gain from their riders uh, confidential. Um, we go over a code of conduct not only for the drivers but also for the riders. We train them on working with older adults, um, mobility challenges, um, gates, and uh, vision impairment, um, dementia. Uh, and also an important part of our training 
is talking about their role as gatekeepers in our community. We have about 130 drivers that are out and they are the eyes and ears of our program and our community, keeping people safe and connecting them with the resources that they may need. So we really impress that uh, on them, plus um, if they ever have any suspicions of uh, abuse of any kind, that they, in Tennessee everyone's a mandated reporter, so we impress that on them and give them the phone numbers that are needed to make a report. And then finally, we train them on our software, which we use uh, assistive rides which was built just for what we do. Um, our rides are not free, and every one of our riders has uh, a membership program, I mean um, membership that they buy annually of $25, and then each ride is $6 a round trip, and our software tracks all of the accounting functions, so when a person takes a trip, it's automatically deducted from their account works really well. We've been in business for just over five years, and we've given 25,000 trips in five years. Um, for our community, it's a, really a gift um, to the non-driving older adults that we serve. Um, the whole concept of smiles is neighbors driving neighbors, so we, again, encourage our volunteers to pick uh, riders in their neighborhood as close as they can. And the next slide on um, supervision, we do have regular contact. We email our pending rides, so our volunteers sign up for the rides that are convenient for them online uh, by logging in with a username and a password into the software. And they we send out a list of pending rides to our drivers twice a week, once on Tuesday and once on Friday. They get a list of all the open rides and sign up for the ones that are convenient for them. Our manager of our program uh, spends a lot of time texting drivers back and forth um, on, the, on her cell phone, um, trying to make things really convenient and really easy, and she does a lot of problem solving for volunteers um, through the phone and text and email. Uh, so we have a lot of contact with our drivers. Um, our riders all call in to schedule their rides, so we talk to our riders regularly. We have about 200 riders. Um, they are not shy to tell us if they are not happy with a ride. So. That's how we pretty much supervise the driving and the, the interactions of our volunteers with our riders. The riders will let us know. We don't have to really guess <laughs> because they'll tell us if they're not happy. And the most important thing, the next slide, um, the most important thing that I think a lot of you are interested in how we explain liability insurance. And we found it really effective to talk about our insurance as layers of protection. And I often say, if you are a good Samaritan and you take your next door neighbor to the grocery store, your auto insurance is going to cover you if you're in an accident up to the limits of your policy. That's the only coverage you're going to have unless you have some type of umbrella policy with your homeowners. When you volunteer in an approved program like SMILES, your auto insurance policy is always going to be primary. No one can take that away from your vehicle. But we also buy an excess policy for all of our volunteers. This excess volunteer liability, excess auto liability, excess accident medical coverage, and that is to the tune of a million dollars over and above their personal auto policies. In addition, the next layer of protection would be the general liability policy that our agency carries. 
which I, our program is part of a community action agency in our county. So we have general liability that would additionally kick in. The thing that's really cool in Tennessee is our legislators realized how important it was to use volunteers for transporting non-driving seniors. So in 2015, they enacted a law um, called the Protection of Volunteer Insured Drivers of the Elderly. And what it says is that if a person is volunteering in a program that drives elderly people, they are not liable unless, of course, they're negligent. So our Tennessee law has really um, come to reinforce the value of what we're doing with volunteers driving seniors. And finally, there's a federal law, a volunteer protection law. However, that covers everything except driving. So the Tennessee law covers the driving, and the federal law covers anything outside the car. So basically, um, there's five layers of protection that really are our volunteers are explained how this works. And we haven't had issues with many people. People, if they want to use liability insurance as an excuse for not volunteering, then they will do that. So that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, so many great uh, uh, presentations. We really appreciate all of your uh, time in providing the information on your programs and some of the things that you consider with um, risk, liability, and insurance. Uh, and so just a reminder, um, that is our final presentation uh, for this particular webinar. Um, but we have plenty of time for questions, which is good because we have had plenty of questions submitted. Uh, so a reminder, though, um, you can still ask your question in one of two ways. Um, you can either type your question into the chat box, which is at the left bottom of your screen if you're in the webinar room, um, or you can email your question uh, to hedmonds at n4a.org, um, and that's h-e-d-m-o-n-d-s at n4a.org. Um, we have received um, several questions in advance. Um, many more than we could possibly get to uh, today. But as Virginia mentioned in the beginning of the session, um, the answers to all of the questions will be provided, um, I, I assume, with the um, archived version of the webinar. And if that's incorrect, she can correct me when she, when she does her closing remarks. But, but I assume it will be uh, provided with the archive um, of the webinar itself. So, um, so with no further ado, um, I am going to go ahead and start presenting some questions. Um, we'll start with the um, list that we received in advance. Um, and we'll be mixing in some of the ones that um, we've received uh, today as well. Um, but just keep in mind, if we don't get to your question, um, please don't be discouraged. We will provide um, the questions uh, and answers uh, with the archive. So, um, so let's just go ahead and get started with um, one of the main uh, areas of confusion um, clearly by the questions that we received, um, which is um, how do you define volunteer transportation? Uh, and so we've clearly heard uh, some descriptions of the programs that you guys offer. Um, but if you could just give us a quick um, uh, idea of your definition and how your organization um, defines volunteer transportation so that we can um, build on that in our, in our uh, 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 subsequent questions. Whoever would like to start. Um, yeah, hi, this is Maureen Doherty with Sonoma County. Um, I'm happy to start. So for us, um, we consider volunteer driver transportation in the pure sense that the um, drivers are not getting paid. Um, so that has come up in the past with other funding opportunities and other um, programmatic structure suggestions that have emerged from our um, community partner work groups and consortiums is, you know, can't we give a folks a stipend? Um, is there any financial reimbursement that we could do? And the answer has been no, because that would change the nature of the program, and it would cease to be a volunteer driver program. Um, so for us, a volunteer driver means that the person providing the ride is not getting paid for their service. Thank you. Anyone else want to? 
Maybe one more of the programs address the question. Um, Christy, this is Virginia, and I'd, I'd just like to interject something here. Um, I, I think that volunteer driver programs, uh, which are, can be called volunteer transportation programs as well, um, can be defined really based on the community need. Um, clearly, we've heard from volunteer driver programs where the volunteers drive their own cars, um, where volunteer driver programs are funded in part, at least, through membership and pro-ride fees, um, where volunteers may be reimbursed for mileage or not, um, where volunteers can um, uh, drive um, their own cars or cars that are owned by the organization. So I think volunteer driver programs, you know, are there's there's a huge umbrella in which different programs can kind of fit their definition. So I'd welcome any additional comments that any of the other um, presenters might have about that. I think um, this, this is Jennifer. Joey. Oops, sorry. Go ahead, Joni. This is Joni, and I think uh, the key to a successful volunteer transportation is to tailor it to the circumstances of the community. And so if it's not reasonable for somebody to drive their vehicle 60 miles each way, um, then maybe it would be good to provide vehicles. Um, in our situation, we only serve our county, and so our drivers all drive their own vehicles. We don't own any vehicles. There are other communities in our neck of the woods where they are traveling 70 miles to bring someone to a hospital. And it just it just begs um, for the the reasoning that it's whatever the community needs, that's what needs to be created. Yeah, I would second that. This is TJ, and, and as I led off, I uh, spoke to the rural nature of, of our geography, and, and those trips are, like, like you had just said, 60 to 70 to 100 miles sometimes. So yeah, that, uh, that lent itself, I think, for us to make the best decision to have our own vehicle, an efficient vehicle, uh, to provide for those volunteers, as expecting them to drive their own vehicle those distances, also with some some mountains and some passes that factor in, so with some weather and things like that, uh, just seemed a little bit uh, big of an ask. So being able to customize the program to your to your community, to their needs, to your region, I think that's that's the key takeaway. And, yeah, and this is Jennifer, and I'm gonna I would like to echo that as well as that. Um, you know, we. Those who are presenting on this, we're coming from very, very um, diverse geographic areas and um, very different. And I want to echo what Virginia was saying is that, you know, it definitely depends on the community. Um, also, what I wanted to note about NV Rides is that we work with a real cross-section of organizations and community groups. Um, we work with Shepherd Centers, if you're familiar with that model. Um, it's a national organization of um, volunteer-driven nonprofits that are comprised of really seniors helping seniors. Um, the average age of our volunteer drivers is about 67 years old. Um, and so um, regarding what makes a volunteer driver program, um, oftentimes um, shepherd centers are rides that are offered free of charge driven by volunteers. However, we do work with villages, which are um, other, uh, it's another type of nonprofit, which are, um, you know, nonprofits uh, that are community-based of um, popping up around neighborhoods that are seniors helping seniors, and they all have very different models for membership um, and a different fee structure. So when we talk about volunteer driver programs, we um, you know, we convey that they are free and or and or low cost um, to the seniors who are using the services as well. 
Jeffrey, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, a uh, great answer, obviously all the way around, that it should be um, uh, customized to your community. So thank you. Um, so our next question is, um, what should volunteers do to best protect themselves? I am assuming from, the, the question did not specifically say this, but I'm assuming from um, the risk that they are putting themselves into by providing the, the, the transportation as a volunteer. I, I, this is Jennifer, and um, and I want to echo with what Joni um, I think mentioned earlier um, is that what we like to um, when we're out talking about volunteer transportation or volunteer driver programs, um, we like to sort of use the example of you know it's no different than driving your neighbor to the grocery store or to a doctor's appointment. Um, Again, your auto insurance is primary, and that is that is your protection. Um, and I'm really excited, and I'm going to give Joni a call later to learn about this law that was passed in Tennessee that protects um, drivers of, of elderly folks. Um, and again, you know, this is no different than if your neighbor was to ask you to take them to the store. It's the, it's the same sort of premise. I, I also like what Joni had mentioned earlier about them providing additional um, coverage for the volunteers. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that the agency could then do. I know it doesn't directly get to the question of what the volunteer could do, but it's something that the agency could do if uh, they're able to do so. Mm -hmm. and, one, and one thing that I do also want to mention, this is Jennifer again, is that um, with the NV Rides program, because we um, bundle the organizations uh, that are that are um, providing the volunteer driver services um, through this database, drivers are actually able to pick and choose who they drive. So that I would think is one added protection. For example, if they had a bad experience with a rider in the past, they don't have to accept a, a drive with that person again if they feel somehow threatened or they feel not comfortable with the situation. So that is one layer I would I would say maybe for a, a driver to protect themselves. And this Absolutely. is Joni again and one of the things we do is we encourage our volunteers to either take the AAA driver safety or the mm -hmm. AARP driver safety and mm -hmm. we reimburse them for the cost of that. And that would be a really good way to protect themselves. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so our next question, um, I'll take one more from our um, questions received in advance and then we'll go to the chat section. Uh, so the next question is, what has been your experience if there has been a vehicular accident? This is Joni again, and we've, the only accidents we've ever had have been in parking lots. Um, <laughs> And it's never been our driver's fault. It's always been somebody backing into them, or um, so I don't. I don't. Uh, we have a procedure in place in case there is an accident, but we have no experience with it other than really minor things. Okay. Yeah. Hi. This is Noreen Doherty from Sonoma County, um, and our experience is similar. Um, I'm going to knock on wood here, but in 10 years of service, we haven't had any major incidents, and um, but we have had minor, minor collisions within parking lots. Yeah, stuff that was able uh, we were able to handle easily between um, the two parties involved. Great. And then there's a, there's a follow-on question, which I don't know by the response that we just got if there's going to be an answer to this question, but there was a follow-on question uh, presented in the chat section about um, whether or not um, there was any information regarding the drivers having to access their insurance due to accidents and whether there were any issues with that. Yeah, this is Noreen again. I'm, I'm, I haven't had any um, incidents with that or any issues with that personally. Great. Um, and Christy, this is Virginia. Um, there, 
as you may know, the National Volunteer Transportation Center has been covering and, and following transportation programs for many, many years. And they generally report that accidents in volunteer transportation programs are not a common occurrence. Um, that uh, with good training and good supervision that um, they don't, I mean, they can happen, certainly, and programs and drivers themselves are very wise to know what their rights are, what their protections are. Um, should an accident occur, they can happen. Um, even a minor fender bender, bender like you might encounter in a parking lot. And I'm sure it's, it's a cause of grave concern to the individuals involved. But statistically, nationwide, um, accidents have not been really common in this area. Um, one of the things that um, William Henry, who works in the SEMA insurance program, has said um, is that insurance is one way to protect volunteers, but the policies and procedures and training that volunteers uh, receive um, is equally important. And as long as the volunteer fully understands what their role is and has received training and support, um, their chances of being held liable in a situation are minimized through that, as well as the insurance. I think that's actually a great segue into the next question, Virginia, which um, this is a question from the chat section, which talks about what training um, do you provide for volunteers that are using their own vehicles? So if, if a couple of you want to speak to uh, a little bit about your training program and what uh, training you provide them if they're using their own vehicles versus yours. Well, this is Joni. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we use, we have our volunteers purposely drive their own vehicles because they're familiar with them and it seems as if we have less difficulty recruiting people because we're asking them to drive their own vehicle within their own, basically their own community. Um, the only training we do as far as uh, driver safety is what I said where we will reimburse the, the volunteers if they take one of the safe driver courses um, and we encourage them to do so. They're very comprehensive and a lot better than anything that our team could put together here. Great. All right, so our next question, um, I'll go back to the uh, list we received in advance. Um, how often do you check your driver's uh, driving records? Hi, this is Maureen. Um, so we do a program monitoring annually of our uh, provider agencies. And in our annual uh, program monitoring, we do require our uh, provider agencies to show uh, an annual verification of um, proof of insurance and all that other uh, good stuff. So I, for us, it's annually. Uh, this is for Jim. I just wondered if TJ, since they're driving vehicles that are owned by the organization, mm -hmm. what your mm -hmm. is that? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we do. We have basically one vehicle, as I touched on the the Prius, and uh, we actually have kind of set up an expectation of with our <laughs> pay drivers, but also with our volunteers, that should there be something that went on their driver record and we would like to hear about it first. I know that uh, it's kind of uh, maybe pie in the sky mentality, but we also we also do check um, kind of similar to, you know, like I said, I've explained them, an extension of our paid paid driver, extension of our paid staff. So we check uh, several times a year when we're kind of going through those um, exercises with, with our normal staff. Great. 
All right. So um, the next question is, could you talk a little bit about your policies or procedures for drug testing for your volunteers? Yeah, I can start with that again, and I spoke a little bit to that. But so ours are, we are a nonprofit with some federal funding, so we're subject to FTA guidelines. So they're actually in their own uh, volunteer driver. Well, they're they're in their own classification drug pool. So they have there's an initial test that they must pass, um, and then they're subject to random testing after that. And it is truly random. Um, could be called in. <laughs> Several times within when a year, or others have not been called in at all. So that's that's how we handle it, just sticking with those guidelines. Great. This is Joni, and we do do not drug test our volunteer drivers. Um, we. We tried to make our intake process for our volunteers as simple and common sense as we could to attract the most people to meet the heavy need that we have in this rural area. Um, we do run the background check, and the background check is repeated every month for the first year. Um, we, we haven't had an issue, um, but that's like knocking on wood. Um, and I, I don't know, I think some drug testing would, would scare some of our volunteers off. <coughs> okay. Well, Joni, while I have you, I'm going to ask you another question, if you don't mind. Um, we have a, a question in the chat section asking that you talk just a little bit more about that federal law that you had mentioned for seniors. And also, before you, before you do that, um, I did get a note that said that there's also a law very similar to that in Illinois um, that protects volunteer drivers of seniors, uh, similar to the one that Joni had talked about. So Joni, if you could just maybe elaborate a little bit more on that federal law that you mentioned. The federal is the volunteer protection law. Mm -hmm. um, and that was passed, I think, in the 90s. Uh, but it's not very comprehensive. So it covers volunteers except when they're driving. So when you have a transportation program, you want to have them covered while they're driving also. Uh, that's why the state of Tennessee passed the law that they did. But that's great to know that other states are following suit, because with some volunteer protections in place, it will be easier to expand this mode of transportation for our older adults. Great. Thank you. All right, so we have a question in the chat section that says, do any organizations struggle with missing rides due to the volunteers using their own vehicles? An example being uh, stopping at the pharmacy after a scheduled doctor's appointment. And how do you combat that? When you say missing rides, what I don't understand. I would assume that it meant that um, the the volunteer was late or had a, a conflict of some sort, which caused them to miss a ride. And if you've had that experience, and if so, how do you uh, work around that? Well, in our case with Smiles, um, there are three of us that drive. With a rider schedules a ride. Um, they can count on the fact that they're going to be there. One of us is going to hop in at the last minute if we have to. Uh, we don't abandon rides. Um, but the, we very, very seldom, I can count on one hand, the number of times that a volunteer failed to follow through with the ride they signed up for. Um, and we've been able to hop in and, and keep the ride and, and complete it as it was planned. Um, any of our other presenters is, have any information yeah, on missed rides? Yeah. This is Jennifer. Um, so also, um, you know, with, again, Envy Rides as being a coordinated hub, um, the idea behind the um, creation of this program was to um, make sure that 
uh, you know, rides did not fall through the cracks and that there were, um, you know, gaps in services were being closed. And the idea behind coordinating the various volunteer driver programs is that, um, you know, because we are in one region and we are networked together as a consortium of groups, um, the idea is that rides will not go missed um, because we are working together um, collectively. For example, um, if a, um, a driver, say, has a ride scheduled um, for example, a dialysis patient, um, and that driver calls in sick uh, one morning with the flu, um, me as the manager of the program and sitting in one place where the uh, volunteer driver program can call on NV Rides and say, you know, we're missing a driver this morning. We're having a hard time. Um, we, we put a call out through the software. We haven't gotten any responses. And then I, as the coordinator, am able to go ahead and schedule a ride and share it with the rest of the network to see if any drivers could then um, pick up the ride. And so we oftentimes will do that so that, you know, rides do not go um, missed. So, for example, um, if there are neighboring communities, each uh, administering a volunteer driver program, um, they'll oftentimes share resources and share volunteers, which is another reason why NV Rides um, requires volunteer driver programs to background check their drivers so that we know that they've been vetted through the NV Rides um, you know, process and that they and, and so there's a sort of a seamless flow of volunteers throughout the volunteer driver programs. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. So our next question uh, is from the chat section as well. Um, it says, churches with vans and vehicles seem to seem like a good fit for providing volunteer ride services. Wouldn't most of them, assuming they are operating with proper insurance, be able to have members who have been properly trained give rides using church vehicles with few issues related to liability? Not sure if any of you have experience in uh, coordinating with church vans and uh, services to help provide volunteer services for your customers. Yeah, hi, this is Noreen. Um, so I don't have experience with that exact example. Um, recently with our Caltrans 5310 grant funding for uh, fiscal year 2018 through 2020, we um, received funds to work with a local nonprofit that has their own van to start a, um, a circular route with their van. So, so with that, we approached it just like we would approach working with any other nonprofit um, that we're entering into an agreement to provide transportation services. Um, you know, we did have to send to our funder all the different specs of the vehicle. So that will be a little, that will be new for us. It's a little bit more complicated since the drivers have always used their own cars. So um, there is a piece of, you know, getting the vehicle um, approved by your funder to be able to use. And then from there, um, the plan is to hire a, a driver. Again, this is not volunteer, but similar model of you know having a driver that will be trained um, and will abide by all of the regulations as laid forth for, through our funding agreements through Old Americans Act and the Federal um, Transit Administration. So um, we were actually really excited about that prospect. Um, we basically had, through our consortium that I have shared, the, the Sonoma Access Coordinated Transportation Services Consortium, we threw out to our group um, that concept, like, hey, does anyone have an existing vehicle that they would like to leverage to provide rides? And this agency stepped forward, and um, they've had these vans sitting in their lot for years, and they see a need, and they, we offered the technical assistance to be able um, to get them to that point of being able to offer services. So that was really what, what they needed was kind of that, that middle person, that middle agency providing technical assistance and helping them work through Caltrans funding and you know the logistics piece. Um, so yeah, we're, we have not evaluated it yet. It's still getting off the ground, but we hope within a year or so we'll have some good um, evaluation data to share more about uh, successes and challenges with that approach. Great. All right. So our next question, um, also from the chat section, um, do agencies need to have internal expertise to, con to conduct driver training, 
or do some of your programs contract that out? And I know, Joni, that we had talked about what you guys do for training, but um, but if anybody contracts out uh, training, I think the question is or the questioner is asking whether or not that's something that's a possibility or that you do. Yeah, hi, this is Maureen again from Sonoma County. Um, so I, something I, I failed to go into more depth uh, earlier on the presentation was our partnership with transit and paratransit agencies. Mm -hmm. um, so we we have our nonprofit provider agencies conduct trainings on their service, um, and we do support our transit agencies in conducting travel trainings. Um, so we've actually hosted our transit agencies multiple times in our um, in our monthly transportation meetings and our consortium meetings to do trainings that way. So we do host um, con uh, technical experts to do trainings. Um, and as far as driver trainings are considered, um, you know, I think it's possible definitely to contract out, but I always recommend leveraging the local resources you, that you have through your either your Sonoma or your transportation authorities or your local um, transit and paratransit agencies because they most likely will have some training resources. They are the experts, and it's a great way to kind of um, show that your agency supports their work and, and also demonstrate to the community how their work um, supports the populations that you serve. So I definitely always recommend leveraging um, experts within your network for training. Great. All right, so um, our next question, um, there's a little bit of a, a background to the question. Um, so it says, something we've run into is whether or not to allow our volunteer drivers to let a spouse or companion ride along with them. Uh, from what I understand in the past, if a volunteer driver wants their spouse to come along, they have to sign a confidentiality agreement and also get a background check. Uh, so uh, the question is, what are your policies on uh, companions or um, spouses riding along with the volunteers that are driving. This is Joni. Um, we don't have a policy on it, but what I would expect is if somebody wanted to ride along with one of our volunteer drivers, if it was a spouse or a friend or anybody, they would have to go through the training and complete the paperwork just like the driver. That would be my initial response. I've never had that request. Okay. Do any of the other presenters have a policy on this or has it not been an issue? This is Noreen. It has not been an issue for us. Okay. Yeah, TJ, not not an issue for us either. Okay. Fantastic. So a little um, uncharted territory. <laughs> All right, great. So our next question, I think we can do one or two more. We'll let, let's see what uh, how long this answer takes. But um, so our next question is, what are your experiences when you have to terminate the use of a volunteer driver, and how did you handle it? Okay, um, this is Noreen, and um, let's see, we haven't had an experience of having to terminate a driver. Um, we've definitely had experiences of um, client driver challenges, communication challenges. So um, within each nonprofit agency that we work with, there's a volunteer um, driver coordinator. So that's the that, uh, coordinator's role is to be the liaison between any um, riders and drivers that are challenged with each other, they've reassigned um, riders to other drivers and vice versa. Um, so usually, you know, because of course it's a, a free labor force, volunteers, we try to um, do everything we can to um, make the relationships move forward as best as possible. So for what it's worth, that's, that's our stance. Okay. Has anyone had to terminate a driver? Yeah, I don't, we didn't. 
we were kind of at that point with one who wasn't working out, just uh, struggling to navigate town and perform the, the duties of the volunteer driver role. But uh, fortunately, she realized she was kind of at that point too. So it was kind of a mutual uh, mutual parting of ways, but we've never had to, to terminate uh, technically. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, so it, it sounds like there haven't been that many issues, which is really nice. That's um, that's um, that's a great thing to not have to to worry about. All right, so um, so I think we'll take one more question. We got started a couple minutes late. I know it's right now three thirty. This will be a very short question, and then we'll uh, close the session uh, for the afternoon. Um, but so our final question is just: What additional resources um, would you recommend um, specifically with regard to risk, liability, and insurance? Um, but if there's a great one just on volunteer driver that you or volunteer transportation program that you want to mention, that would be great too. But um, but what are your go-to resources um, for this particular topic? Um, here's Noreen again. Um, so for us I, in the past, you know, go-to resources has been um, connecting with our paratransit service providers and looking at their regulations. Um, and we've kind of modeled any policies and procedures that were in question be, uh, based on what what their policies and procedures were, since they're um, dealing with you know federal transit funding as well. Um, so that that's helpful for us. Uh, this is Joni, and when we were creating SMILES, we actually worked hand in hand with the legal department of our general liability carrier for our agency. Um, and they really were very helpful on managing risks. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Those were um, really great questions. Thank you um, to the uh, participants and to the presenters um, for all of the great questions and great information. Um, really quickly, before I turn the session back over to Virginia to finish us up for the day, um, I will let you know that we are going to send out a webinar evaluation. Um, it's a short evaluation that just allows um, the NADTC to keep track of how their webinars are going and to get feedback so that um, future webinars can be improved. So I'll be emailing that out to all of the registered participants here in just a few minutes. Um, it's a short survey, so please take a moment to uh, complete that if you would. Um, and so with that, I'll turn the session back over to Virginia to get us uh, closed up for the day. Thanks, Christy, and, and thanks to our uh, four presenters who really, I think, provided some fantastic information. Um, obviously, there are more outstanding questions that we didn't get to, and um, as Christy said, we will include those um, with responses in the archive uh, when we post it, when we post the webinar on, on our website. We will also um, be um, Providing you all with, um, with we'll, we will be posting information from the overall course, and we'll link that uh, to this webinar as well, so that you can access um, more information about volunteer transportation programs um, that was available through the course, including a really, I think, excellent resource list. I would like to point out one resource in particular, um, certainly go to the NADTC website. You'll see a couple of publications that we've done in the past on volunteer transportation. Uh, one is uh, an information brief, and the other is the blog that I cited earlier, the five keys to successful volunteer driver programs. Um, in addition to that, on the National Volunteer Transportation Center website, um, and you can access that simply by typing in National Volunteer Transportation Center into your search engine, um, there is an online course 
four volunteer drivers um, that you may want to uh, check out um, as a possible resource for your program, if you, especially if you're just starting uh, a volunteer transportation program in your community. Um, so with that, uh, final thank yous. Um, in addition, uh, you'll see on the last slide um, contact information, including our toll-free number, which is 866-983-3222, and our um, email address, contact at nedtc.org. Both of those are ways to get in touch with our technical assistance staff. So if you have specific questions that you don't want to wait for the posting um, to get answered because you're working on them, you really need the information and the technical assistance, um, please reach out to us. We will be glad to take your question individually um, and give you as much information as we possibly can, as well as support. Um, and we're very interested in knowing um, those folks who are developing uh, community volunteer transportation programs um, and ways in which we can be of assistance. Um, obviously, this is a very hot issue for many of you. And um, stay tuned. We will be posting information on the website. Um, and we may consider doing additional um, webinars in the future. I think you have a, a, a place on the evaluation form uh, to suggest future topics for webinars. Is that right, Christy? Um, I don't remember if that's on there or not. But you know what? I'm going to go and add it right now. Thank you. Thank you. Because um, if there are particular aspects of volunteer transportation or other topics altogether that you'd really like to see the NADTC address in a future webinar, we would really love to hear from you. So with that, I'll say thank you and thanks to everyone uh, who made this webinar happen. Good afternoon. Thank you.